Hello and namaste. My name is Brandon and welcome to the next video in my series on basic time series. In this video, we will continue our discussion of forecast accuracy measures, namely in this video, the mean square error or the root mean square error, which you will see on a lot of output that deals with time series forecast accuracy. Sit back, relax, and let's go ahead and start learning. These first few slides I will go through very quickly. They are the same slides that I've been using in the previous videos. So even though I'm not sure if you've seen those, I'll go through them just in case you have not. So what we're looking at here is the Nigerian GDP per capita from the year 2000 to the year 2020. And it looks like this on a graph. The question we've been asking is, how might we approach making a forecast for the year 2021? And we use the naive forecast to do that. The naive forecast is very simple, as you might guess by its name. The forecast for the next period is just the actual value from the prior period. So in this case, you can see that the Nigerian GDP per capita in the year 2000 was $1,451. So that becomes our forecast for the year 2001. And we continue that process all the way down the columns. Then we figure out our forecast error, which is just the actual value there in that second column minus the forecast value in the third column. So for example, in the year 2003, the actual value was $1,764, the forecast was $1,686, and the difference was $78. So it's just actual minus forecast to get our forecast errors. We always want to look at our forecast errors visually. So here in this graph, we have the forecast errors for this time series. We can see that on the left, the forecast errors are positive. That tells us that the actual values are above the forecast values. Remember the errors are actual minus forecast. Therefore, if they are positive, then the actual values are higher. On the right hand side, the values are negative. So when we have negative forecast errors, the actual values are below the forecast values. So by looking at the magnitude and the sign of the forecast errors, we can learn a lot about the underlying time series. So know your errors. Forecast errors create a new derivative time series that can be a treasure trove of information for the analyst. By looking at just the naive forecast errors, you should be able to reverse engineer how the underlying time series looks by looking at the forecast errors alone. In fact, many forecasting techniques do this very thing under the hood. So patterns in the naive forecast errors can reveal trend, seasonality, inflection points, and, and all sorts of information about the underlying time series. And examining naive forecast errors can help in the selection and interpretation of more advanced forecasting techniques. So time series forecasting is about selecting the forecast technique that actually creates the forecasts and then different ways for measuring the errors of those forecasts. It's kind of a matrix. We'll look at that here in a second. The forecast errors can help inform not only the best way to generate the forecasts, but also the best measure for evaluating those forecasts. So here is the Nigeria GDP per capita versus the naive forecast. So this green line represents the actual values. The pink line represents the forecast values. You can see there's a gap. In the first 13 or 14 years of this forecast, the actual was higher than the naive. And then on the right, the naive is higher than the actual forecast. And the question is why? Well, a series of positive naive forecast errors under forecasting indicates an upward trend in the series because the forecast itself here is just the actuals slid over one period. And if there is a trend, the forecast cannot keep up with the actual values. And on the flip side, a series of negative naive forecast errors or under forecasting indicates a downward trend in the series. So root mean square error or RMSE. So the root mean square error, the subject of this video, is just the square root of the mean of the squared forecast errors. So we make forecasts for each period, find the forecast error for each period, square each forecast error, sum the squared forecast errors, divide by the number of forecast errors or observations, that's the mean part of the root mean square error. Then we take the square root of the mean square error to return the original units which in this case makes it the root mean square error. If you have learned linear regression, this is basically the same thing you see in the output for linear regression for mean square error and of course root mean square error. 
So note that the mean square error is in the squared original units of the time series. So in this case, if we're just looking at the mean square error before we do the square root of the mean square error, it's actually in this case, in this video, squared US dollars. That doesn't make any sense. So keep in mind that the mean square error is in the squared original units of the time series, which makes it difficult to interpret. Taking the square root returns to the original units. So the root mean square error. But in this case, so it makes more sense, we take the square root, which returns it to the original units. And now we have the root mean square error. But even that can limit comparisons with other time series that are in different units or magnitudes. So in this case, we could have GDP measured in some other currency. We could have GDP not in constant dollars, but in real dollars, which would include the effects of inflation. We could have the errors that are in percentages, which would be comparable to other time series. So just keep in mind that in the case of the MAE, which is the mean absolute error of the previous video, and in this case, the root mean square error, those are actually in the original units of the time series, which in this case is constant US dollars. So here's our table again. We have the actual values, the forecast values, the forecast errors, and then the squared errors. So look at the magnitude of some of the squared errors. They are massive. We can see there in 2002, the forecast error was $187. We square that and we get a value of almost 35,000, which relative to many of the other values is very large. This is one of the characteristics of mean square errors and of course root mean square errors. When we square errors or in the case of regression residuals, it heavily penalizes large errors more so than small errors. And think about it in your head, if you see in a graph of just the function x squared, you know that over time, it's not linear, right? It, it starts off small, then it increases, increases, increases the slope of that. And that is a function of the squaring of the values, which as they get larger, it gets more penalized in these sorts of mean square applications. So the mean square error is just this. Summation, error squared, divided by the values. Find the forecast error for each period, that's the E sub I. Square each forecast error, of course that's the squaring. Sum the squared forecast errors, that's the green summation sign. Divide by the number of forecast errors, which is the observations there in the denominator. And then we take the square root of the mean square error to get back to the original units as the root mean square error. So in this case, in the squared error column, in this table, those are actually squared US dollars, which of course doesn't make any practical sense. So we take the square root and then we're back to regular US dollars. So if we do that, in this case, the mean square error. So if we take all of those values in the orange cells and find the mean, it is 7,713.75. Again, that's squared US dollars. So we take the square root and the root mean square error is $87.83, which makes a lot more sense. So let's go back to the previous video very briefly to kind of show how these things fit together. So here are the absolute forecast errors for each year. So we can see that all we do in the absolute sense is we just make everything positive. We can see the magnitude of each forecast error over time. We can see here that a few things are going on. The average of these mean absolute errors was $76.55. Again, the MAE is one of the forecast accuracy measures that we learned about in the previous video. So the mean of all these absolute forecast errors is 76.55. We can see that over here on the right, the forecast errors or the absolute forecast errors are relatively smaller than the first half. And that's because the time series flattens out. And that gap between the actual values and the naive forecast is very small because when the time series flattens out horizontally, the difference between the two is negligible or a lot smaller than if there is some sort of trend or some sort of seasonal pattern. So here's where it makes a lot of sense visually. Here are our mean absolute errors and then we square them. So the green errors here are just for reference because these squares don't actually line up perfectly to the time series below it. So you can kind of have each arrow as a reference point when you look across. So what are we seeing here? Notice that the errors that are larger have extremely large squared values. And if you're asking, 
Are those squares proportional to the errors below? The answer is yes. I painstakingly sized all of them so that they are proportional to the errors below. So we can see that in 2002, there's a very large absolute error. So when we square that, we get a very large square, literally. As we go across, we can see there are cases where the absolute error is large again. And I'm saying the absolute error here, keep in mind that doesn't really make a difference because when we square our error value, it's gonna make it positive anyway. So if we square the original error that has positive and negative values, or we square the absolute value of those values, it doesn't make a difference. Because of course, a value like negative 10, if we square that, that is 100. If we square just 10, that's also 100. I'm using the absolute errors here because it's easier to graph. But as you can see, I put little skulls on all these large errors and see how much they are penalized than one next to it. A perfect example here is look at the square with the second skull and crossbones in it. If we go down there, we can see that the forecast error is about you know, $118. Look to the right of that where the forecast error is about half that. So actually a little bit less than half that, about $70. Now look at the area of the two squares that correspond to those. See how much larger that square is than the one to the right of it. And that's because the larger the error, the more penalized it is in mean square error. Now, if we take the average sort of area of all those squares, we end up with the blue square on the right. So that's the mean squared error over on the right. As you can see that, yes, we have some large squares here, but then we have other squares that are very, very, very small, almost to the point of being imperceptible. And when we average all those together, we end up with the average area of the blue square over here on the right. Here is our forecast accuracy matrix I mentioned in previous videos, and we're kind of filling this out as we go. So remember on the left-hand side, we have different forecast methods. So far, we've only done the naive forecast because it's easiest to learn, and we can go ahead and learn the forecast accuracies based off the easy naive forecast. And then we'll do other forecast methods below that. So we have naive forecast, forecast method B might be like a moving average, or method C might be like a weighted moving average or something like that. So those are the methods in that first column. The forecast accuracy measures are along the top, so in the previous video, we learned about mean absolute error, and that had a value of $76.55. The root mean square error for this video was $87.83. Kind of see how this works. Just remember, the goal is to minimize the forecast error for the known time series, and then we're gonna use that forecast method or methods to make forecasts for future unknown values. And of course, when we get into larger time series and more serious sort of applications, we would actually split our time series into like a training set and a test set. But at this stage in learning about forecast accuracy and forecasting in general, we're gonna use the entire time series. So we'll get to that other stuff in later videos. Now, not all forecasting and evaluation methods are appropriate or even possible for data with certain characteristics. For example, data or errors that have negative and or values of zero. Some forecast accuracy measures will not apply to those or cannot be applied to those because you'll have division by zero and things along those lines that make it not possible. Evaluation methods are sometimes in different units. We talked about that earlier. So they can be in the original units, in this case, US dollars, they could be scaled, percentages, and so on and so forth. So we have to be careful about interpreting them. So therefore, comparisons of forecast error occur within a method or between methods that use the same unit or scale. So what that means in this matrix here is that we will compare down the columns. For example, in this case, we have root mean square error for the naive forecast. Well, we'll have forecast method B, that will have a root mean square error, C, D, and E, and we'll look down the column to find the smallest root mean square error when looking at that accuracy measure specifically. So that's what we mean by that bullet point. Now, of course, it is very common for methods to disagree about which is the best method for forecasting. So the lowest error might be in forecast method A. The lowest percentage might be in forecast method C when we get to uh, percentage errors and so on and so forth. So they don't always agree necessarily. And the way that would look is that, let's say we take the mean absolute error and we look down the column. Well, maybe in that case, forecast method D wins that column. It has the smallest dollar value. Maybe we go over to root mean square error and forecast method B wins that column. Therefore, B2 
sort of wins. That's how we have evaluation method three and method E. But you, you see what I'm getting at here. So if we look down each column, the winner might not be the same method when looking at the smallest values, or in other cases, it might be a ratio. Some evaluation methods are ratios and we interpret that a bit differently. But in general, whatever the evaluation method is, the winner of that method may not be the same for all methods. Awesome. So that wraps up this video on forecast accuracy, the root mean square error. Again, it's just building off the mean absolute error we saw in the prior video. In this case, we just square each value, add them up, and then divide by the number of observations, take the square root, and we have the root mean square error, very similar to what you might see in linear progression. So I hope you found this video helpful. Like, comment, and subscribe if you don't mind. And I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Take care, keep learning, and bye-bye.